Of all the symbols of German militarism, one stood out, Krupp Industries, backbone of the German military industrial complex for generations. The Krupp factories headquartered in Essen had been hit by Allied bombers. Beneath the rubble, much machinery was, surprisingly, still operable or could be saved. Krupp's managers had preserved what they could of their industrial plant and maintained 65% production through March. One of the American soldiers entering Essen was counterintelligence aide Alex Raffaelli. A European-born Jew, he had earned a doctorate in political science at Heidelberg. He spoke German and Russian like a native. He was known to his colleagues in CIC 216 as a superb interrogator. As soon as we entered Essen, I was directed to Villa Hugel, the Krupp's palatial residence and the headquarters of his enterprises. Alfred Krupp, a hard-faced man in his late 30s, stood surrounded by our military policemen at the entrance to a huge gray building that looked more like a factory than a private residence. The military policeman turned him over to us, and on the spot, I decided that he would be treated like any other Nazi prisoner. Shortly, Raffaele proceeded to interrogate Krupp. Hitler's way was totalitarian. Did you approve the methods? Life is a fight for survival, bread and power. I'm blunt, for there is a need to be so in hours of bitter defeat. In this tough fight, we needed strong and tough leadership. Hitler gave us both. Do you still back him? Are you a Nazi? No, I changed. Our government cheated the people. We didn't really know what went on. We crops never cared much for ideologies. All we cared for is a system which is efficient and gives us the opportunity to work undisturbed. Politics is not our line. With considerable industrial plants still standing, the most obvious corporate offenders, like IG Farben, had some of their factories blown up. Many of the old firms, Krupp, Siemens, Daimler-Benz, and the components of IG Farben, were effective monopolies and the ground rock of the Nazi regime's military might. They were the target of what the Allies called dismantlement and decartelization, designed to break their exclusive hold on economic power. In June 1947, a year later, the United States made a dramatic and major step towards the recovery of post-war Europe. The new Secretary of State, General George Marshall, called for massive and coordinated European economic recovery. The American aid became known as the Marshall Plan. The western zones of occupation in Germany were surprisingly included as major recipients. As capital flowed into Germany, many of the same firms that had worked for the Nazis now applied their energies to peacetime product and to providing jobs for German workers. Even as German industry began to revive, a second round of trials, known as the Nuremberg Economic Trials, began in August 1947. The accused were top industrialists, such as Alfred Krupp, Friedrich Flick, and the IG Farben managers, men who had been the backbone of German industry during the war effort. These Nuremberg trials were more controversial than the first. Many Germans saw them as a kind of revenge of the victors aimed at satisfying Western public opinion and keeping Germany down. Prosecutors bared the industrial underside of the German war machine, providing evidence that Alfred Krupp had both supervised war production and was an active member of the Nazi party. He regularly exchanged intelligence information. A Krupp factory at the Auschwitz complex produced fuses for the war effort. Krupp had permitted and even encouraged slave labor, signing detailed contracts with the SS. 
Thousands had died from hunger and beatings, not just at Auschwitz and far away, but in company factories at Essen. On July 31, 1948, after nine months of trial, Alfred Krupp was sentenced, along with nine members of the firm's board of directors. Krupp received a 12-year sentence. He had expected that. And then, surprisingly, judges announced that both his personal and company property would be confiscated, thus shattering the Krupp dynasty. Witnesses recalled that Krupp grew faint. Political affairs was the line of John J. McCloy, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of War who personally accompanied American forces into Germany. Though from a modest background, McCloy was a former Wall Street lawyer and very much of the American foreign policy establishment. Fifty years old at the time, McCloy was a key policymaker who hadn't wanted to bomb the Auschwitz death camps. A diversion, he thought, from the main goal, beating the Germans. But he was shocked by what he saw of German destruction. With military rule due to be replaced by a civilian one, a new Allied and American leadership came to Germany. For four years, John J. McCloy had been engaged in an active private life as lawyer, president of the World Bank, and as consultant to the powers that be. Considered one of America's wise men, in his spare time, he advised presidents and statesmen. Now, in mid-1949, President Harry Truman asked him to take up the post of U.S. military governor, and shortly, civilian high commissioner. McCloy arrived to a job that, as much as any, would determine the future of Europe and post-war stability. McCloy supported measures to clear Germany's conscience and rehabilitate its name. Under Adenauer, Germany began negotiations with Israel and Jewish groups for reparation payments to Hitler's victims. Adenauer mounted pressure on McCloy to halt denazification and modify the Nuremberg sentences. A specially appointed board after a year's review recommended widespread clemency. In January 1951, in an action that many outside Germany found shocking, McCloy commuted, paroled, or reduced sentences on 79 of 89 war criminals. He affirmed only five of nine death sentences. Most Germans reacted positively. The most controversial of the decisions had to do with Alfred Krupp. McCloy released him, effectively sweeping much of Germany's Nazi past under the rug. McCloy also restored the Krupp family fortune, overnight making a convicted war criminal one of the world's richest men. Alfred Krupp came back home, welcomed by friends, family, and Krupp workers and managers. Though there were still demands for its dissolution, in effect, the Krupp firm was preserved. Normalcy had returned to Germany. <laughs>